0650. All right, citizens' comments. We're going to start with Chuck Tomberlin. Yes, you do. And state your name, and um, you'll have three minutes. Thank you, uh, Chuck Tomberlin, and uh, being a past educator here in the system and many other places. And I know so many of you, uh, Ginger, I taught alongside of you. And, um, yes, you did. I know your son so well, and what a reflection. What a magnificent young man. And uh, I applaud you for that. You know what I do. Uh, I want to thank the school system for all that they've done because it's a great place, and I talk it up no matter where I go, uh, in the state, out of the state, everywhere. Uh, you know, and I know we are really high in the state as far as our standings, too. But you know, we've got a lot of problems like so many other places do too. But I'm questionable about Common Core. Tom knows I've called him a couple times on it. And I think many of us are confused over it too. And especially when I dig in the background of uh, Arnie Duncan, which I would encourage all of you to dig into and really find out who he is. Uh, or isn't. Or isn't. Morally and ethically, uh, I, I really don't think he follows our guidelines for Christian ethical values. Uh, I am a pastor, I have been for like 23 years, uh, I was a pilot for Delta, and I'm a Marine, still a Marine, not once a Marine, but I'm still a Marine, so I believe in God, country, and flag. Uh, we wonder what's going on, what's, why are our kids failing, and why are they faltering and falling behind? Why are we number 37 in math, for example, in the world, in America? I'm not putting down our school system, but what is happening, where did their hope go? Why are our prisons so full? Why do we have fences up around our schools all over the place? Why are we afraid to even get in there, much less go in there? Is it to keep us out or to keep the kids in? Or is it, what is it? Where are we with what we believe and hope for? You know, I think this whole thing is a spiritual problem. We pay more money for each children, each child in our school system than the rest of the world, by far. We just shove the money out. And I would suggest the Common Core, the basic, really, intent down deep of it is control and is money from a, a high level in Washington. My son is a lobbyist, so hey, you know, what can I say? But he works for 25,000 independent pharmaceutical agencies, and he is a graduate from this area. And I'm very proud of him, and he works both sides of the house. So he sees everything that's going on. But we're, you know, I know Washington. I know it too well, as we all do. What are they really after? What do they really want? I think it's something we need to really be on guard with always. If you see something free, or if you see easy money, it, it, I'll give, give you an, an idea right now, it's not free. It's going to cost us. It is going to cost us. And if the money isn't working with our kids when they're dropping out right now, I have a granddaughter, Jordan. She's a sophomore in Chris River High School. She doesn't want to keep going. I'm doing everything I can to keep her going, to keep her motivated. And she's just so bright, but she has no hope. Got another grandson in, in Washington, D.C. He doesn't have any hope. He's 19. He graduated high school, but he has no hope. What, what happened? What did we do wrong? And real quickly, as a pastor, and as an American, and as a Marine, I want to suggest maybe what Joyce Myers suggested. Maybe we took too many things out of the school instead of, instead of doing other things. Maybe we should put them back in, like prayer like prayer in the school, like prayer at football games, like all the good stuff, the Ten Commandments, maybe the belief and the hope and the strength from within. I know many of our teachers are fine Christian people. I know they are. And I applaud them and lift them. When I taught, I taught Spanish. And I taught from the Spanish Bible and I never told anybody, except uh, Hickey was the superintendent then. He'd come sit in my class and listen. <laughs> so you know I was using the Spanish Bible. But it tells about the good news, the good news. And it says in the Bible, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Let me say that again. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Do you know what they're doing in China, in rural China? The parents are sending the kids to Sunday school class underground, jammed with people, standing up, full attention. You know what they're doing, asking for? Not one, not two, but three days of solid preaching from eight in the morning until eight at night. They stand up in a heated, overheated room, these kids, wanting and dying and begging because they don't have a Bible. They have no hope. Chuck, you're out of time, honey. Okay, so I would, in, I would encourage us 
to think about those values. I know we're up against the fence, but you want solutions for the school, you want hope, bring that hope back to them. Okay, next we have Quentin Heron. Okay, for the record, my name is Quentin Heron. I'll make my comments brief this morning, I promise you, Mr. Bryan. Uh, concerning the whole business of school board meeting September 10th, I propose that the school board consider, actually I propose the school board have a independent committee look at the same as dress code. After remarks, you made it, Mr. Bryan made the comment that they would take it take under advisement. I'm here to get an update on that, find out when this might be discussed, and so I'll prepare a better presentation. We, we have to take it to workshop. They get, we, we, we have to be in workshop. Okay. How do we go about getting that on the workshop agenda? We tell it to Ms. Ferdinand and she puts it on there for us. If we request it. If, if, if we request it. Uh, in writing? No. No, if the board does. If we request it. I'm sorry, I lost you somewhere. Forgive me. Uh, we, we the board, have to decide if that's something we want to workshop. And if we decide that's something we want to workshop, we give it to Ms. Verderami and it'll go on. That's something you decide if you want to exactly. workshop. And there has to be three of us who want it. Okay. Okay. Can you count to three? Say it? <laughs> no, 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 no. Just no. a joke. <laughs> hey, uh, Okay, very good. There's a, there's, a, there's a way to get around that, I'm sure. Should I start my number two? Yeah, now? start with number two. Okay, you want to reset my clock? No. Okay. Separate subject. Are you reset my clock? He still has one minute and 26. Oh, okay. Because his light went off. Oh, okay. Um, during also that same meeting, I made some uh, uh, comments about the student uh, code of conduct book. Now, it had not been revised in a number of years. Uh, apparently, I, I, I reached a button, Mr. Kennedy, and uh, I want you to know that I have uh, in my possession here copies of 2005, 6, 8, 9, 13, 14, and indeed there have been a number of changes. However, they have been editorial changes for the most part, with only two significant changes. All right? um, they basically stay the same. I maintain my position that they, the, the code of conduct book has not changed significantly, but substantially. It still remains ineffective. Ambiguous and incomplete. The two changes that have been made in the handbook are the use of corporal punishment, which you stopped somewhere between 2009 and 2013. I have no idea what year, I don't have the handbook. There's no more corporal punishment allowed in our, in our public schools. And number two, Mr. Kennedy was very, very adamant about the use of cell phones. You have stricken cell phone usage in school during normal classes. Oh, yes, you have. I challenge you to check on page 22 and 23. You cannot use cell phones and wireless devices during SAT testing only. Okay? Uh, seriously. Ms. Kennedy, if you're sitting there responding about our challenges, sir, look at page 22 and 23 and tell me. I mean, it's not 22 and 23, it's 22 and 24. Nonetheless, oh, yeah, 21 and 22, I beg your pardon. Okay? Okay, you're out of time, sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, can a school board member make a motion to extend my time? Can a school board member make a motion to extend my time? We could. But we've got a large agenda today. Okay. If we extend your time, we extend the time for every single person that stands at this podium. We are fair and we are equitable, which we everybody the same. Well, with the same respect and the same roles. That's why we have them. Yeah, it's just, it's just, uh, it's just, uh, arbitrary this three minutes, nonetheless. Uh, please do check page 22 and, uh, how much you think? All right. Thank you. All right. Business and support services, Mr. Blocker. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. Uh, I have another comment. Uh, Alona Kearney. I hope I didn't butcher that too badly. <laughs> um, mine is more of a question, it's not really a comment. Um, I am an Army veteran and I homeschool my kids. 
And my question is, like, I haven't had a chance to look all over Common Core, but my concern is as a homeschool parent, where do we fall in as far as being considered? And on top of that too, a lot of things I know in time past have been brought up about minorities being excluded in, in you know, like certain kind of cases and things. And how are we going to be protected in our rights as far as Common Core and homeschooling going to be pro protected? Because from my understanding on some things, when it comes to go to college, certain, I guess, inappropriate things are going to be made to make it difficult where our kids are excluded from being able to go to college and different things. So I was just really, it's more of a question of where do we fall in as homeschool with Common Core? You mean I, our kids, who, what do you mean by our, which homeschool? Um, homeschool, oh, homeschool. yes. I, I don't see that being a problem through Common Core. Okay. I do not see that happening. <clears throat> okay. Ms. Bryant, maybe, um, maybe one of our, the directors or one of the people, Ms. Uh, or Ms. I was, gonna, I was gonna have her get with Mr. Clotter and especially if you've got some specifics and um, our ed team, our ed services team can address that. Okay. okay. But Mr. Clotter, am I right? That should not affect. That is correct. Thank you. <laughs> we'll set you up an appointment with Mr. Clotter. Okay. He's our expert on Common Core. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Now we're done with citizens' comments. I think we are. Hey, Mr. Walker. <coughs> we, have, we have several items uh, on the agenda to, in fact, meet the mandate of the $2.4 million that was in our budget on the Florida Education and Finance Program that was earmarked specifically for uh, in salary enhancements, and we have met that mandate by through negotiations uh, with, with all the um, bargaining units, and we've elected to go that route instead of the, the uh, 2500 3500 is to use those dollars as we're allowed to through negotiations. So the items A, B, C, D, and E are reflect those um, increases. With the chair's permission, I would like to uh, make a motion that would encapsulate A through E. Is the chair all right with the motion? I am. Is that okay with everybody? Looking at the verbiage in A through E under business and support services, um, I'd like to make a motion to approve the revised and ratified contract between the Citrus County School Board and CCEA with a 2% salary increase across the board, a 15-month increase for health insurance board match, and language changes as provided in our, in our agenda to include the following staffing areas, instructional, ESP, Teamsters, non-union support, professional technical, and administrative. We have a motion by Ms. Balfour. We have a second. I'll second it. Thank you, Ms. Deutschman. Yes. Um, and this is kind of something I fuss about every year. Okay. Um, some of these uh, salary charts had the original salary chart and the amendment. Some didn't. So it's very hard to kind of figure out exactly what the dollar increase is to each one of these um, steps. So this is the amendment. This is a new one. Correct. Can you tell us what the average raise was? And for which unit? For the teachers? Structural staff. Structural staff, I think it was like three and a half, I believe we looked at the other day. Three and a half what? Percent. And what does that equate to dollar wise for the average teacher? Let's say the average teacher makes $40,000 a year. That'd be what, $1,500? Well, 10% would be 400. So they said it was three and a half percent. Three and a half percent. Of 40,000. Well, 10% would be 4,000. So. Okay. It's around four. Three times four is twelve. <laughs> <laughs> Simple math. Three times four is twelve. Point three times 40,000 40, would be twelve hundred. Is that right? Right. Plus change. Right. Okay, and then they also got their step rates. Right. And how much is the average step rate? 
that phrase is varied because you know that step was only could have been a couple hundred bucks to okay. one step got like six thousand. All right, forget the six thousand and forget the one the small one. The isn't there like after a while they're kind of even? No, there's no even steps. That's the Three, issue with some. Bucks. $200. What's more common? Mm, could be five, six hundred dollars. Okay. There's some so, that are a couple thousand. So. All right. So some teachers, so we get filled at that six thousand dollars big steps at the end. That's correct. Okay. So taking those out of the mix, so I would say an average teacher might have gotten, let's just be on the generous side and say as much as two thousand dollars in a raise this year. Maybe less, maybe yeah, more. Yeah, probably more like less. But yeah. okay, probably more like less. Right. Uh, my point is this: is that. You know, our teachers were under the impression that the governor had promised them, promised them $2,500 as a minimum raise, right? and that the teachers that were highly effective were supposed to get $3,500, and yet we at the school board know that that promise wasn't funded, and it wasn't funded sufficiently in order to be able to give out those kinds of raises. Um, and so this is happening across the state. It isn't just a Citrus County problem, it isn't just something that happened to us. It's like other other districts, I think, had no rates at all. So, uh, you know, I think we somewhat apologized to our teachers that we weren't able to give them the kind of raises that they expected because the governor didn't put the money in the budget. And that we stretched every penny we could to try to at least do this, which is right. more than they've had in the past. When we looked previously at the, uh, the mandate, the $2,500 and $3,500 for the highly effective, I think we would have been about $800,000 short right. of what they funded us in the FEFP, about $2.4 million. If you read the language to the to the letter of the law, it actually said up to $3,500 for the highly effective. So if you did $2,500 for effective and $2,501 for the highly effective, we still would have been short approximately $400,000. So we were nowhere near making the mark as to what the governor said. That's why the legislature went back in after the district started asking these questions and they gave us that or remember we described that or yeah, as they negotiated right. Language, right because they couldn't mm -hmm. force us to get money we didn't have and then right. how much an additional one and a half million dollars mm -hmm. to shore up the florida retirement system our portion of that correct was also unexpected and a, did, they didn't include that in our budget that's correct okay so just so we're clear on that because mm -hmm. you know this has been an ongoing issue uh, for a long time i guess once the governor opened his mouth like two couldn't get back in right. bed. And now they're actually inquiring as to why districts haven't approved these increases. So it takes time to negotiate and go through the right. process and get it through the through the bargaining unit, which they just uh, ratified Friday. Um, and then we use the language in the Teamsters contract as the Me Too to actually satisfy that need. But our staff actually did approve this level raise. The instructional CCA staff did approve it 95 to 5 on the support and 86 to 14 on okay. the. Okay, so they understood what the issue really is. Absolutely. Appreciate that. Yep. There was a lot of hard work on your part, though. I know that because I think there was a disconnect between what they were told, um, how we were funded, and then trying to communicate that so that people would understand what the issue came down to. It was a matter of the, un the underfunding of the <coughs> Oh, yeah. Um, Mr. Blocker, do you recall roughly how many effectives and how many un how many effectives and how many highly effectives we had? You don't know. Does it no, I'm, I'm a lot to look back for last year. Um, no, we calculated that. Yeah, I'm thinking it was 400 for the highly effective and six or seven hundred for the effective. And so now, how did the governor when and the legislature when they put their budget together? Um, one would assume that they would say Citrus County had roughly 400 effective and are, are, are you know, and then and they're highly effective. So we're going to send you funds based on that. <clears throat> and like they would with the FTFP, you'd think, well, then we'll we'll send you that money. And then if you have less than that, they take it from us. And then if you have more, they do it. So is that how they did? Well, they actually got the data from DOE. Mm -hmm formulated their budget and uh, their uh, allocation. But I think they also then took a percentage. I mean, there's only so much money to go around as to how much they thought that we would need and it didn't meet the mandate because most districts had a lot of highly effective and effective teachers as, a, a, as opposed to what they assumed that we would have. Uh, so so that's the, the allocation issues. amount was not determined using the same ruler that they were using that we we're having to give out or that they asked us to give out right. those same increases 
So you're saying the state uh, believed, they based all the figures on uh, a belief that our teachers were not affected? Well, I can't say this. The DOE sent the data to the governor. The governor <laughs> then insulting. determined what the allocation was going to be. It is. What have they done that hasn't been insulting, Linda? I'm just curious. If, we, if the mandate was not pursued by the board to follow through, is there a penalty? We would draw down the money. Because the next item after you hopefully approve these multiple is to approve the plan so the plan can be submitted to DOE to then draw down the money. Because without that, you don't get the money. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you know, and this is happening over and over that we, in the school system, we receive some statistics, some information, and it, in order to make decisions. And then other groups, the, the commissioners or the legislature, they receive totally different information and they're from the same figures. Right. I mean, you work with figures every day and that can be done. You can say, yes, he is tall, yes, he is short. Like, you, can, you can have opposing views. When we try to make decisions, you should have the same basic information and it does not happen. And again, the idea is, is that both our state and federal government have continued to say to us, um, oh, you're going to do this. Otherwise, we're going to penalize you, or we're just not going to send you the money. That's correct. Yeah. Um, let's see, we have another thing that we've had to be forced with a financial gun to our head of race to the top. And it was told to us by the legislature, you're going to do it. Um, the Common Core came to us as also a legislative mandate that was started through race to the top. So there are many times when, unfortunately, they are putting a financial gun to our head. I, I will probably vote for this in favor, but I don't like being continually having a gun financially put to our head and say, you are going to do this, and by the way, we're going to give you different rules to follow than what uh, we're funding you at. And so the majority of our budget that we receive from the state is all earmarked as to how we have to spend it. So. I just want to thank you guys for muddling through this and everybody coming to a consensus. Especially thank you. Staff. Thank you. There's some districts where they're going to impasse and, and it's very contentious. So I appreciate that's why I was <clears throat> saying to the teachers, we apologize and we also appreciate mm -hmm. your understanding of working with us on this because um, this was out of our hands and they, and, you know, they got it. Well, and my appreciation extends to the fact we're focusing on the concerns with the value added model of appraisal with the holes that have been identified. And because we have identified holes in the system at our local levels and state level, I think it's critical the way you've worded this, mm -hmm. that we make sure that it's across the board at this point because the system has been proven to have some, some concerns. So I definitely appreciate the work that's gone into this to make it fair. But we have to remember, they modified that just for this one time. The VAM is only was removed only for this one time. They've still put that VAM to our head and said, you will follow the VAM with all of your other races beginning with next year. Or the instructional side. And it will be the state's formula that we have to follow in the future. Right. And that'll be for the instructional side, not the support, but right. for the VAM. Anybody should get on one of the committees up there to interpret the step. I like it here. Yeah, what, I like it. No, I don't mean to leave here. I just want to volunteer. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second. If we have any further questions or comments, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 5 0 on A, B, C, D, and E. Yes, ma'am. The next item <laughs> is to actually now approve the plan uh, for the salary allocation to meet the mandate of the, uh, the language in the Florida Education Finance Program to then submit to the uh, DOE to be able to draw. <coughs> so that's the next item. On the approval of the salary allocation plan for the County School District for, is it just this year? That's correct. 2013, 2014. Second. We have a motion by Ms. Deutschman and a second by Ms. Powers. Do we have any questions or comments? Just, um, Mr. Blocker, mm -hmm. same thing when we're approving this um, with these understanding that the FDFP, um, FEF, the FEFP will require local required effort and since we have an understanding that probably Duke has already said that they're going to challenge the assessment, 
Uh, do we still have that statute situation that we can uh, do by disapproval? That's correct. We'll be able to draw down those dollars like we did last year if Duke does to do what they did in the past. Also keep in mind, the next calculation is in a couple weeks when we do the count. If our status or our student enrollment goes down, mm -hmm. this allocation will go down. Right. It's not a, uh, like your ESE guarantee or your SAI, those are, those are, those stay steady throughout the whole year. This has the, uh, the basis to be changed. And then will they look again in February? Is that That's correct, one? yes. And in February, if it's more, will they give us more money? Correct, they'll make an right. adjustment. Just like they do the rest of the stuff. All right, fluctuation, okay. We have a motion and a second. Any further questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries five zero. Human Resources, Mr. Bishop. Good morning. I'd like to request the board's approval of the instructional and support recommendations. I move approval that we approve uh, the school board support and instructional recommendations. We have a motion by Mr. Kennedy and a second by Ms. Dorchman. Do you have any questions or comments? I'm just curious about the um, term position with Wendy on, at the academy. Mm -hmm. Is that term status a request of the administrator? Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the position you talked about, the uh, data clerk where the position was a teacher and went to data clerk. Mm -hmm. Mr. Stofcheck asked to uh, upgrade that position to a data clerk uh, position out there. It'll be just for this term? It'll be a term position, yes ma'am, I'll be re-approved. Okay, thank you. I was just gonna say we have a bunch of those terms that we just, we do re-approve them eventually, but yeah. How long does the out-of-field assignment last? How long can it last? A person can teach out-of-field for one year. Yes ma'am. Um, Mr. Bishop, I had both the, ple the pleasure and disappointment of having to meet with a teacher this week who just really needed someone to talk to. Had nothing to do with negativity about our district or about our schools or administrations, but just about teaching in general and the challenge that I think we all know that, that so many of our educators and administrators are facing. And she was in tears um, as she talked about the fact that she just didn't know if she could continue doing what she loved so much. And again, made it very clear it was not about our, our uh, district, our schools, or our class assignments. You know, those, she said, those are just part of what we accept. But one of the questions, and I thought it was is valid, is um, do we still do an exit interview or an exiting um, questionnaire? When someone who likes to separate from employment, Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, there are questions that they can answer. Um, you know, oftentimes people are probably a little reluctant to do that sure. with fidelity because they don't want to burn the so-called bridges uh, in case they ever want to come back. Um, I've too had conversations with many of our staff members that have had uh, yeah. similar concerns, like you shared. Um, I think the way we support those folks is to reach out to them, let them know that you know we're, we're here to help them, support them in any way they need. Um, whether it's just they need someone to talk to or whether they need help from our ed services department or what have you. Um, but those conversations are pretty regular. And I, and I know you do, and I, and I have so much value. Um, I, you know, Miss Susie does a great job at, you know, being that coach and saying, you know, okay, what can we do? <laughs> you know, we want to we wanna keep encouraging, because these are good people that have offered. Is there anything in the exiting that, that really talks about the profession of teaching even, or that, and, and I guess it's a question I would say is, is does the board see any value in saying, uh, you know, is it people that are just leaving education because of education's sake, not, you know, the, the environment, or do we have that as part of that exiting process? Because I, I, I question that over the next coming years, the norm is that we have a list of retirees that we can continue that are a little larger than what we have typically seen in the past percentage-wise, because I think people are frustrated. If it's a, the will of the board, you know, we can definitely go back and look and at it. And it doesn't have to be a decision today, but it's something I would say to, to, 
Well, that, I think that's one of the things that we look at when we do our review of our HR, mm -hmm. which is our hiring decisions, but also <coughs> why people leave and try to figure out is there something that we could be doing to, to keep people on the staff. Absolutely. So I think we've asked for a report sometime in the It's coming next month. Yes. Oh, it's good. Oh, okay. The adoption workshop will be doing the state of the district and we'll include that information in yeah. part of that Excellent. Of the board. Excellent. I, and it's hard because I know sometimes people are not as forthcoming as you would hope because they, you know, maybe they're embarrassed, maybe, you know, they don't want to tell you why they're leaving. Um, yeah. I mean, that happens, so. Absolutely. But we'll uh, we'll bring that information to the board on the Thank you. Shop. Thank you, Mr. Bish. Okay. Any further questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5 0. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you, sir. You too. Bye. School operations, Mr. Mullen. <coughs> Mr. Claude. <laughs> Good morning, members of the school board, Superintendent Mrs. Himmel, Assistant Superintendent Mr. Mullen, and School Board Attorney Mr. Bradshaw. Coming to you asking for approval of the Master in Service Plan at our uh, workshop special meeting. The Master in Service Plan has actually been updated in 2013. We are uh, required to have board approval on this every year, and we will be actually in implementing the uh, an overview of the, of the Master and Service Plan this coming school year. So, Lindy will be coming back to you with a revised plan. Lindy Worthaler had communicated with you, I believe, on Friday of last week in regards to the location of the Master and Service Plan, and if you had any questions. Just a kind of a summary, the Citrus County Master and Service Plan provides the foundation for the planning, delivery, follow-up, and evaluation of all district professional development activities because the acquisition of all ap and application of new knowledge and skills by school board employees has been a significant impact on student achievement. The professional development part department in conjunction with the district schools and departments provides continuous professional growth opportunities designed to address district priorities and school-based goals and objectives. Master and Service Plan includes a catalog of uh, course components required for the apparel of in-service points which are used by educators to renew their certificates. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just to, to move things along, uh, go ahead and move that we approve the Master and uh, In-Service Plan for 2011 through 2016. We have a motion by Mr. Kennedy and a second by Ms. Powers. Questions or comments? Mr. Clotter, is this is part of the discussion we had during our uh, HRMD meeting. Is this, this was in part, this was a piece of that agenda, yes. if I recall. That's correct. And um, <clears throat> board members, I'm, I'm the board member that sits on that committee and we met a week ago or so, a um, week ago last Friday. And I'm pleased because uh, I think everyone recognized we're we're needing to really look and do a a full overhaul of not just the in-service plan, but really how it all fits together with developing of administrators, developing of pre-administrators, we may say, and uh, and also supporting the teachers. Is this, if I recall, that conversation is that this will be looked at as part of that whole process that we're kind of undergoing or that the HRMD plan is embedded into the in-service plan. And so we're going to, and that, that whole piece, while we're approving it today, it is right now though beginning an ongoing yes. process of, of really in-depthly going through, which might have been an easier conversation before yesterday's memos from the governor. Um, but uh, that aside, I think those were some of the pieces to say, okay, instructionally has common core and the development that we're doing there. How do we develop our administrators? How do we support our administrators and, and so forth? So I guess what I would just share with the board is those were ongoing discussions during the committee meeting of that, because I look here and it says there's, there's no uh, changes to the current plan. That's true for the moment, but that is not what the conversation within the committee was. It was to have that and then to begin that discussion. And then if I recall, it was to bring back to the school board in a workshop setting to have some dialogue with with the board members on that 
So I wanted to lift that up to the rest of the board. The um, uh, Lindy Worthaler uh, has been involved in a technical assistance professional development uh, workshops that have gone all through last year. McCrell has been basically the provider of those and Lindy has been including some various components, some school personnel, district personnel, and it's a technical assistance to be able to uh, provide us with guidance on writing that master and service plan and revising that. Again, the emphasis is going to be on no longer the sit and get of professional development, but basically seeing how it is actually being embedded into that delivery or into that classroom and into the uh, school operations. Okay. And it's a fluid document. It's brought to the board every single year yes. for review. Um, we've got a board member representing the board on the committee. Um, you accept input from all board members uh, and looking at the constant, ever-changing need of professional development based on legislative action and implementation of things like Skyward, we definitely have to meet the needs. And this is a nice shell for us to follow with the understanding that we are fluid in meeting the needs of the students with instruction for staff. So at this point. But I don't think we approve this every year. Well, we don't approve this every year. No, I no, think that was a misunderstanding. Yes. I think we do. It's that it's being revised totally. But when it's uh, the last time in 2011 when it was actually updated, we are supposed to bring it to the board each year for approval. But, but, here you said that but I don't think we have. If there's something that uh, needs to be done, does that play years? Correct. Okay. Correct. It did actually come to you last year. Did it come back just last year? Okay. Uh, and it was, I believe, during a regular meeting. Of course, this is uh, unique because of the workshop, but it was during a regular meeting, and I believe it was on consent. He and I have Alzheimer's because we don't go to the Early slide oh, presents you have not complete. So let me it ask happens. you this, are we still committed to Max Thompson? Is he ongoing or is he uh, as a has needed year to year? Because I don't think we had Max this last year. Good smile. We, no, no, we uh, we did not have him this past summer. That is correct because a lot of our initiatives, again, when we started, well, I just, the summer prior, uh, when I was actually, when Gail Grimm had, uh, had left, we actually brought Max Thompson. It basically was kind of the start of a lot of initiatives that led us towards the Common Core transition. So we did have him, but we are continually in con connection with him. I know that there's a couple of principals that do email him on a regular basis, but as far as bringing him back to our district, we did not have plans this summer to do that. I know you had shared with me about the locations. We did offer in the state of Florida, and again, the principals and school leaders do have that autonomy through our Title II dollars, not only for themselves, but also for their staff to be able to do that. But as far as bringing him back, if that's the wishes of the board for us to do that, but that's part of the conversations that we have uh, on sharing with him. He's been, he's been in Sanders <coughs> County now two times with an overall welcome back in addition. Right. I, well, a couple reasons why I asked that is as I go around <coughs> and talk to schools this year, yes, um, I hear a lot of Max Thompson euphemism, euphemisms. Um, so it's like years ago when we used to have Harry Wong. Harry Wong. <laughs> there was those, you know, Harry Wongisms that went on for years and years and yes. years. And then we had Daggett, and then we had the other guy. I forget who the guy in the middle was. And then we had the guy with the pillars of whatever. Um, so, so the Max Thompson um, strategies are are being used. Um, and he talks about those ones that are the most highly effective and most, you know, and, and those are the ones that we should have fidelity to. But I think as we have new principals at every school, we have new staff at every school, those they kind of start dissipating. So if we really and truly believe that Max Thompson tells us what it is that we need to know or be reminded about, I think we need to be reminded about it on a regular basis before we forget. Um, so I, I thought it was, and the other thing that was interesting to me about the comments, and I've shared this with you before, Max Thompson said to us, I don't know, it was just when we were having that lunch with the, the, the non-lunch, mm -hmm. but um, he said, you know, Citrus County, I'm really impressed with Citrus County, he said, because you're a high-performing district, and you still ask me to come back. Thanks. He said, the ones that are struggling are the ones that have me come in. He says, the fact that you are so committed to your professional development tells me that you guys are so professional and that's another reason why you stay at this high level is because you know that you can never let let it just rest on your laurels and just keep doing what you're doing. You're always striving to do better. 
Um, so I don't want to lose that momentum or even that philosophy. If we embrace that, then I think we need to follow up. And that was number one. Number, number two question I had was, um, again, talking especially more at the elementary schools and the high schools, <clears throat> because it, Common Core has been more focused at the elementary schools. From school to school, there seems to be a different um, commitment to whether or not we're going full board Common Core, whether we're going to invest all of our in-service and professional development in Common Core, or whether we still know that we have all of our eggs in the FCAT basket, and we can't let that basket go because that's how we're evaluated. So, I, so is, are you get well, Christian, I don't know if you go around as much, and I don't know if you're going to tomorrow, and, and that will be some of the questions I'm going to ask you, too, is what are we as a district doing to make sure that we have continuity and uniformity in all of our schools? I mean, is, is that something, again, that we're looking at? Sure. Let me go back to Max Thompson, if that's okay. okay. When Max Thompson came, we basically provided each school eight slots for them to be able to bring to Max Thompson. So obviously their assistant principal and their other uh, school leaders had an opportunity to come. So they basically heard, so it wasn't just the principals, they actually had that opportunity. Um, this summer, as you know, and I shared with you before, uh, is that um, a group of uh, school members could actually attend the summer Common Core. So basically, they basically had developed, and we're gonna kind of get into this today, about presentations that were consistently throughout all of the different content areas. So they're consistently hearing the same thing. The schools actually then um, do submit to us a action plan. Uh, I shared with you that the February is that the action plans are posted on our website. That will be part of this board's review as you go through your school improvement plans. You're gonna actually see that appendices at the back side of that school improvement plan, what their plans are for the professional development for Common Core. We then get those and then we sit down with Lindy's team and go through those to look for that consistency. So they should all be similar? Yes, ma'am. And they all should have the same goals and expectations? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so, and this brings me back to our discussion a month ago when we looked at our school grades and the state school grades and our fluctuation in, um, performance is that still FCAP based the, the I'm sorry the professional development or no the, the results of the results of professional development are now almost contradictory to our evaluation system we basically provide to the state <laughs> oh. our results and those results are on that FCAP 2.0 right which is next generation sunshine standards and not common core and as they were explaining to me, fifth grade now has to multiply and divide fractions, which was never a fifth grade expectation. So I guess everything is kind of moving down the grade. We start to blend in, yes. Yeah, but the FCAT is still based on, and I'm not so, so sure if those things that were FCAT was based on are no longer taught at that grade level, or you know what the what the difference is. But we saw we're starting to see the results of commitment to Common Core yes. and evaluation based on the old system that they're saying the old system's no good. It's like, I guess we have to apologize to all these kids that we thought the next generation of sunshine is going to be the standards. I mean, you know, it's mind boggling the kind of things that the administration of our state says. But, um, It'll but that's, you know, but we have, to, we have to be responsive to our kids too because we're putting them at risk of not graduating from high school because of the FCAT, and yet we're, we're committing wholeheartedly to Common Core. So I think somewhere along the line, we've got to either say, is it about the student outcome and their ability to, to move from third grade to fourth grade to get out of 10th grade intensive reading for the rest of their life and to get out of high school? Or is it this commitment to Common Core ideology because somebody says that's a good idea instead? But there's no testing on that, and as we just learned, you know, <laughs> we're in the territory of that. Yeah. So, I, so I, I guess when we look at our in-service plan, my question is, is there a continuance of reinforcing our next generation sunshine standards and FCAT practices because that's what our kids are being tested on? And I think... If you were to write that question down, you probably have. 
No, um, it's in my head. It okay. burns in my brain. Well, drop that down. Drop some of those thoughts down. Okay. And when um, we've got teachers here today to talk about <clears throat> some of our blended classrooms and next generation and Common Core, and that may be answered, but if not, <clears throat> then we'll go from there. But it should be answered. Ma'am, I, 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 Mrs. Worthaler and I have talked about this, and again, that's as we transition to that next assessment. There is a very close tie between that curriculum and assessment with our professional development plan. Uh, assessment via FCAT. Yes. So we're having teaching. And this is sort of a teaching versus testing, not teaching to the test, but teaching versus mm -hmm. testing. Conundrum. Ben, I think when you went through sort of the history of what was done in education, jumping one person, one philosophy to the next person, uh, what you're saying right now points it out. We don't seem to, uh, we're going someplace, but we keep jumping on different trains to get there, and it's very confusing both to us and everybody else. And just because a new person comes in with a new plan doesn't mean we should jump on that train. Or that plan's any there. better than the next guy. Or and, then, and then they say, well, we're doing this because the other one was no good, but then why did we do it? That's exactly right, right. Because they are playing political football with our children's education. I think that's and it's not just one party and one group. They have continued to do this. They are playing it now. They, th they initially put the ball in motion. Now they're continuing to move it as it fits their political agenda. And I am tired of our children suffering. And now they have made it for our teachers. They have demonized our teachers, and they have demonized what is being done every day. And I am tired of them hurting our children. I think the important point to pull out of all the dialogue that's taking place is, is the apparent frustration. I think as far as how we as a board can move forward, sharing that part of our responsibilities to discuss frustrations with legislators, I think that's an ambassador role that we should play. Um, each one of us will move in, in the appropriate manner that we feel fit within our arena. Uh, at this point, looking at what we're trying to accomplish with this agenda and understanding the box that we're in as policymakers for the Citrus County school system, um, I would encourage and urge us to look at what we have to be responsible for today and then take all those frustrations and encapsulate them in dialogue that is meaningful and move forward to our legislators. Ms. Balfour, that, that really seems like that's like maybe that's not been done. I can tell you, we have spent hours. We hours. have spent, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm thinking as a, yeah, we have spent years on this. I, I will tell you, the Florida School Board Association, who has rallied together, we had just a year and a half ago where the, the governor's appointed department um, chair, the uh, commissioner of education, came to us as school board members and scolded us for speaking out in this behalf, scolded us. We have legislators that literally run from us when we come up to Tallahassee. We have been doing this. They have their own agenda. This is not about them listening. This is about the things they want to accomplish. And until the public, the public and the parents absolutely take control of this. The reason we're talking about Common Core as much as we are this last month is because of people. It is not because of the legislators. The legislators are the ones this conservative legislature put in Common Core. This conservative legislature in the, in the Federal um, Department of Education have put this in. This is an agenda. This has been pushed by a very specific group of individuals. And no matter what we have said, no matter what we have done, it has not been about our influence. It is about educating the public to saying what has been wrong for our students. And unfortunately, and this is the unfortunate part, our superintendent, her staff, and the teachers have to be compliant to all of that because they have to keep our students learning every day in whatever rules that are given to them. Trust me, I'm very much aware so of my, my frustration isn't directed at you, it's directed at we've done it. They don't want to listen. They really do not want to listen. And I will tell you, I thought the same thing 
I thought I would be able to, to do that. And I will tell you that what they, they have made it clear, when you are scolded by the, the commissioner of education because you spoke out about standardized testing, and we were told our constitutional obligation was to follow the policies of his department. Those were his words. But he says it was the law. Then he lost the job. Oh, and then we have another guy, and he lost his job. We're still standing. <laughs> okay, uh, we've, we've, if the horse is dead. The horse, I think, is dead. But I tell you, if he, if he gets up one more time. <laughs> so is Lenny going to make a presentation to us about in-service and, and where we're headed and what we're doing? And if not, I would like to request an invitation to else. Okay, to on the revised one or this current one right here? Whatever. That, it is. That, if we can wait until the revised one comes out, that would be okay, the, the, the part. Because I think, and I think that was the okay. that was. Okay, so we have a motion by Mr. Kennedy. We have a second by Ms. Powers. If we have any further questions or comments, I wrote it down. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. <laughs> motion carries five zero. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. <laughs> well, this law is not coming back to the <laughs> We're getting the trap collided by 11 a.m. I still got my soapbox back here. <laughs> but I'm trying to keep it away. Uh, Mr. Bradshaw? Uh, no, ma'am, except for... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that you have a policy review on the workshop, but I don't want to state for that. But I do feel that you have to step out and have a last minute phone call to the Okay. Okay. Uh, you will be back. We won't take it personally. Thank you. I'm assuming, I'm assuming, is there anything else on here that you want me to stay for as far as the workshop? I know we have the administrative hearings of the line, so I'm going back for that. How are you? Mm -hmm. That'd be good. Just the policy review come back to that. Yes, sir. That sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Mall, do you have anything? Oh, <laughs> Ms. Balfour? No. Ms. Powers? What do you do if I say yes? <laughs> <laughs> just very quickly, I uh, just want to say I went to the uh, School Health Advisory Committee, and out of many, many things we discussed, but one thing I wanted to uh, let you know that we're going to go interact, and I know that uh, Roy's going to come over and explain all of that as soon as it's ready, but interact with school menus so that children can access, find out all the ingredients, all the nutrients. Nutrition, everything. Really? Yes, yeah, so that'll happen, but he'll explain it in full detail. Hmm. Set the tone. Yeah. Uh, uh, There'll be an app for us. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for that. Uh, right. <laughs> um, the second is uh, on October the twelfth. Uh, I'll be judging a chili contest. All right. <laughs> at the Nature Resort. Um, because they volunteered you? Because, yeah. Uh, Don't get to try to me. <laughs> hey, I, I pass. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be 12 at 12 noon. Hey, um, you want to speak for Some of y'all, if you do, come on and join in and make some chili. It'd be great. Uh, I went to the Pucci Regional, uh, not Regional, excuse me, uh, Technical Institute for their SAC meeting. And uh, they went through all the different you know, programs they have and, and what they're doing. Uh, and they're going to get an additional amount of money from Duke if you keep giving out money, I guess. Imagine that. Save their, <laughs> giving us back our own money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of $100,000 that will be presented to them. Um, anything else? I went to uh, Crystal River High School, uh, Cancer Council, also. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, is that by your wife? Did yes, you? Nice <laughs> chat. Yeah. Your son is a nice friend, you did, right? He's yeah, so that's but uh, yeah, and uh, Jeff Dawsey is the chairman. The chairman. The chairman. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Cool. And uh, Chad, who's on TV with the uh, love commercials. Yes. commercials, he's the vice chairman. So. Oh, gosh, I can't remember his last name. Yeah, right. So, <coughs> but anyhow, yeah, that uh, terrifically organized meeting. And I heard it was like a huge turnout. It was like a lot turnout, of people. Very organized. Mm -hmm. It was just getting started with elected people. So uh, there was more time, a lot of specifics covered. but. Uh, they did talk about the school, what's happening within the school, and the schedules and stuff. So, and they'll be the next meeting will have more specific ones. Like and I think that's it. There is other stuff. I don't know. So go ahead, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kennedy. I had the pleasure um, being at, at a bunch of our different schools, but I, a specifically Constitutional Day and Constitutional Week. 
I was so excited. I, I started out at uh, LPS, who had a kindergarten. I think we had it on, this, on the website, the Kindergartner Parade. It was so wonderful. And then I went to a class Miss Howard was teaching and modeling a lesson, and she was incorporating not only the Declaration of Independence, our Bill of Rights, and the Constitution, and then using those um, for uh, reflective reading and using, interestingly enough, I would think of as Common Core standards to actually then, uh, you know, see what does this mean and how does you find the source and, and so forth. So that was really exciting. Um, I, I don't want to take it from um, from Miss uh, um, Bryant, but uh, we also went to Crest and saw a great presentation on 9-11, so I'll let uh, Ms. Bryant well, share you go that. Right ahead. It's, you go right on ahead. We have, <laughs> we have people, um, and one of them, I just got to lift up her name, Angela uh, Vincent, her husband used to be one of our SROs. She, uh, following 9-11, um, went there on behalf of the Sheriff's Department and counseled the workers at the site. And she did a presentation about what it was like, um, really appealing to students of explaining what it, not necessarily what led up to it, but the cleanup and how we were rebuilding and how we uh, were moving forward. And you know, and then um, the SRO uh, Farham, Todd Farham, came in and he had just been there, and he and Deputy Faraday had brought back artifacts. Um, in fact, I had the chance to see them. If you, anyone had gone to the um, Inverness uh, Chambers, they had them for the 9-11 exhibit. And they brought back artifacts, including two uh, doors from a police cruiser on that day that was damaged. And then also, there was there's a monument that was like a dome, a bell type thing that was right at the center of Ground Zero. And the top of it, we have in Citrus County. <coughs> and so they brought these pieces back. And so he talked about that and then talked about going there today and what it's like. The students did not, I mean, they were so quiet and so excited about it. So it was, it was just, you know, seeing all of the different things at Constitutional Week, talking to my, my own children, I was very excited. Um, I got to just. Um, I want to add before you yes, leave there that they're putting those things in a museum. Yes, okay. it's like one of the largest private collections of 9-11 um, art. Um, something that again, you know, we talk so much sometimes about collaboration, um, our teachers working together on grade levels. Well, I have to just lift up. Um, we have two principals that uh, I had a chance to, to visit both of them and have them talk about that they decided to trade pay at places one day. Um, Donnie Brown and Nancy Simon, I thought were very brave. And they basically turned over each other's schools to each other to determine what things were both successful and they could improve at each other's school. And they gave very, you know, real important feedback to one another, reflective feedback of positive growth. Um, and now they're sending staff back and forth to each other's schools. They, uh, it, it was exciting because one had told me about it, and then when I got to the other school, they, she mentioned it. They just loved how much they learned about themselves and about their schools by visiting other schools and doing that. They did it on their own. I said, did, did, did Mr. Mullen make you do this? And they said, no, but he was very supportive of it. <laughs> and um, so they had taken this on. It was, I just, I, I just was so impressed. And if you have a chance, I would encourage you to talk to them because they really learned some neat things about what they're doing to each other's schools and to help each other. Um, the other th last thing I would just remind you is I cannot be there because um, our family's going away this weekend, but Ed Camp, is this Saturday at Crystal River High School. Um, I just hear just more and more incredible things. I was in a classroom yesterday and saying, hey, have you done this? And she's like, no, but I'm hoping to learn about doing it at Ed Camp this weekend. So the teachers are so excited. Teachers giving up again 
another day. They're not getting in-service money for it. They're not getting um, paid. They're not getting paid. Uh, something they do most most every evening. But uh, but I'm very excited about Ed Camp again this year. So, and that's it. Okay. Ms. Schwartzman. Um, I'm going to start working with Mr. Hubert tomorrow on the uh, District Advisory Council training. Mm. I think I was in this at school every single day last week, and very different um, parent involvement and parent attendance. So, so Christopher River High School, you said, had a lot of parents. <coughs> Is there any other schools that you all have gone to that had high parent involvement? Like Hanto High school? school. Christopher River. Wait a second. Hold on. Hold on. Um, <coughs> So, Chris River High School. The Canto High School. High School. How many parents were there? Oh, six, eight, at SAEC. Right, okay, and? Chris River Primary, um, probably 12 parents. Really? It was strong. Chris River Middle was very strong. Chris River Middle. Middle. Yeah. It was it's very strong. It didn't get a You know, I was at Citrus Springs Middle School last year, and there was a huge slow, too. If you count the teachers and parents, teachers not the teachers, parents. not the teachers and parents. I know. Because here's here's part of our our, our challenge. More than fifty percent of the SAC members have to be non-district employees. Mm -hmm. So even though they're teachers at another school, they still count as a district employee. Mm -hmm. So getting community members and parents that are not employees is really becoming an issue. So so I'm looking for examples of schools Crystal that have. Is that the one you went to last time and you said? Lady was so enthusiastic in that. Where's Lady? No, Canto Middle. Yeah. And I missed the Canto Middle because I was at Pensacola. Well, Crystal River Middle has always consistently been okay. huge. So we're looking for, we'll be looking for ideas in how to bring those people in and what kinds of things do they. I went to a school that had no parents and one teacher shot. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to find those examples of. Um, highly effective advisory councils and, and getting parents involved and trying to figure out what it is that they do. And then they don't know if you find this study because it's going to two other ones that yeah. the time ran out that you said that the parents bought. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is that all? Well, I, for, I tell you what, I was impressed with too, at Crystal River Primary, and again, I've not seen every single SAC meeting, so there could be more doing this. But the student participation is very strong. Really? At fourth and fifth grade, she, yeah. she has it set up where they serve two two years. So they come oh, in as yeah. fourth graders elected by their, their student body. Um, and then they roll over to serve two full years. And the, the maturity that those kids display, I mean, they were sitting up. And That's the same with the Kanto primary. Exactly. So Forest Ridge is another one on this very And same thing. And, you know, Forest Ridge, and they, in fact, they had just spoken to those, and I got to introduce um, the kids, students that just got elected for their next term, because they keep rotating. Yeah. But you know, we don't, I don't know, we do it at the elementary, and then I don't think we do it at the secondary level. What's that? Our students. Oh, yeah, I was at Citrus High School, and they had two students, and they were, Did they? Okay. yeah, and they were very vocal. And there were you students know, at Canton uh, <coughs> High School as well. Yes, well I think the key for a lot of them is just giving the opportunity for mm -hmm. input. Uh, if you don't have opportunity, <coughs> people lose interest. Yeah. So maybe that's well, working. here's one of the things Inverness Middle did, and I would lift this up, um, and I don't know if I've ever seen it. She brought the Title I budget for, it, you know, the SAP does, isn't in power to, uh, to approve it, but she <coughs> brought it to have a discussion, to say, this is how I'm looking to utilize it to meet the school improvement plan. And I thought, wow, that was a very good conversation because in, in Ms. Douglas' case, what she you know, did is she's taking all three of those budgets and having right. to take the different pots. So she's saying, listen, if I could do this here, I'd like to do this here. And so she saw them as one piece. So she's asking a question rather than telling what the budget is going to be. Exactly. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have seen them. <laughs> all right. So if you have any other ideas, just should be an email because um, uh, we need to um, not only provide an opportunity for sharing, <coughs> but maybe we need to have some um, examples. Well, I, back to what I just saw, and I, mean, I know other principals are doing different strategies <coughs> to try to get input, 
a creative strategy that I witnessed was somebody giving me a times up. Okay, I don't take that much time. Um, looking at a red, yellow, green system of discussion. So what that means is if you have a red concern that must be addressed immediately because it's a safety issue with our kids, please share it out at the meeting. If you have a yellow concern, so they're, they're measured so that the ability to take action is channeled in the right direction. And green is just complimentary. And complimentary. They do that for so you do red light, green light. Yeah, I was just gonna, well actually okay. in Pleasant Grove, it's interesting you said that Pleasant Grove always does red light, green light. Is that where it is that where okay. all have yeah. a different table kind of <laughs> makes sense staff. But the cancer primary does the same red and, and and I just an interesting way to channel the discussion so that when we are talking about issues that are hot, it's all at the same time. So that they could easily prioritize and make decisions right then how to spend the dollars that are limited. So I, I thought it was just a very good way to give parents that access and freedom to give input and it's like you said, that's why they're there. Did everyone have, I've been regularly getting the conversation about uh, SAC funds. And I, and I think it was taken out of statute, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. but, you know, okay, that's but there's less A money. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, that's all lottery money. Exactly. Stole the money. And Somebody again, stole the money. who did they give it to? They I took know. it away from parents yes. because it was parents' choice where that money went. So we have again taken power away from the people. I did go to um, a lot of um, SAECs this week. I went to Crest, I went to Lacanto Primary, went to Lacanto High School, had a great talk with W. Burton at Lacanto <coughs> High School. Yeah, I hadn't seen him in like forever. Oh my goodness gracious. Um, he talked about you, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> He did, he did. She called him when he was in the hospital in Tennessee. He was able to help her from his hospital bed in Tennessee. <laughs> did you heal him from here? I think you, I think you might. <laughs> um, do you have anything? All right. With everybody's consent, we're going to adjourn. It says adjourn. Make up my mind. Okay, I'll adjourn the meeting. And let's take a 10 minute break. <laughs>